tonight on Reporting Scotland. One of the biggest teaching unions says pupil behaviour in secondary schools is getting worse. The economic impact of tourists, should they be taxed for visiting our biggest cities? Deciding what to wear for the wedding of the year, we catch up with one of the Scots who's got an invitation to Harry and Meghan's big day. Oh, ridiculously excited, but I don't think we're as excited as everyone else is about the fact that we're going. I cannot believe how into the Royal Wedding people are. And it's also a big weekend for football and rugby fans. I'm at Hamden with all of the build-up ahead of tomorrow's Scottish Cup final. While in rugby's Pro 14, Glasgow Warriors prepare to take on last year's champions, Scarlets, for a place in the final. Good evening. Pupil violence towards teachers in secondary schools is getting worse, according to one of the main teachers' unions. The SSTA says more teachers are experiencing serious physical and verbal abuse. It claims some schools and councils are putting their head in the sands and that this is adding to teachers' workload and stress. Here's our education correspondent, Jamie McIver. Right! Calm down. Everyone face the front, please. Challenging behaviour in schools is nothing new. But one of Scotland's main teachers' unions says the problem seems to be getting worse. The most serious issues that our members are relating to us certainly surround violence and aggression, violent language, disrespectful language, verbal abuse, threatening behaviour, and, and in a very few cases, physical, uh, physically assaulting members of staff. For Kevin Campbell's union, the impact of serious misbehaviour is part of a much wider issue. The number of things teachers have to do other than teach. From paperwork and bureaucracy to dealing with problems caused by cuts to the number of support staff. Including those meant to help children who need additional help for all kinds of reasons. You know, teaching staff will not perform well in the classroom if their own well-being is not properly supported. From the Education Secretary, a sympathetic year. He was the guest speaker at the union's conference today and promised to do new efforts to cut the overall workload facing teachers. Right throughout the education system, whether you're the Education Secretary or in local authorities or head teacher or individual teachers, you need to look at what we're asking the system to actually do. And if there is a better way or a more efficient way or a less bureaucratic way to uh, undertake some of these steps, uh, we've got to do that. The government wants to tackle the broad impact of poverty and disadvantage in education. Serious misbehaviour is sometimes linked to this, and the government agrees tackling the effect of poverty on schools is about more than education policy. Reforming education has been a subtle and complex game, almost like chess. There are many teachers who feel they've almost been pawns in the system, and some are looking for a white knight. Only time will tell if the Education Secretary is that night. But teachers will be hoping his intent to cut their workload and give the profession the support it says it needs gets results. Jamie McIver, reporting Scotland, Creef. Should tourists be taxed for visiting Scotland? Small business owners argue it would deter visitors. But councils in Edinburgh, Aberdeen and the Highlands, who've all got plans for a tourist tax, say it would bring in vital support for the industry. Andrew Black reports. So here I am on Edinburgh's Royal Mile. It's the summertime, the sun is out, almost, and there are tourists absolutely everywhere. But more tourists means extra demand for services. To take the pressure off, Edinburgh City Council wants to bring in a tourist tax, which will cost a few pounds per person. Christine Sander, who works as a tour guide in the capital, thinks it can't come soon enough really talking about 250,000 people in August using everything and uh, our, uh, you know, our inhabitants have to actually pay for this. It means the crane, crane on the hill. hill. Yes, I knew that. Aberdeen City Council's also planning to bring in a tourist tax. Today the Japanese ambassador was in town promoting tourism. He gave his own thoughts on the idea. Uh, the cost is always an element uh, 
for the Japanese, quality is more important. Not everyone agrees with the tourist tax. The owners of this Aberdeen hotel reckon it will scare off visitors. We do a lot of work with the hospitals, universities, a lot of leisure trade, um, golfers from abroad. Um, and I think that would be a disincentive to people to come to Aberdeen. And he's not the only one. The Federation of Small Businesses said a survey of its members, many of them in the tourism industry, indicated overwhelming opposition to such a tax. These are businesses who, with a tourism tax, would effectively be asked to be tax collectors on behalf of local government. Um, they already pay um, very many taxes as it is. Edinburgh Council's leader says that's nonsense. The massive increase, sometimes hundreds of percent, increase in the prices that hotel rooms are going for in the city in high season during the festivals is not deterring tourists from coming here. But would visitors be happy to pay? Well, I'm from America, we don't really like taxes, but if you need it, you gotta do what you gotta do. Yeah. A couple means two or three pounds. Yeah. 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 Well, that would be okay to me. Yes, tax is okay. <laughs> Despite the concerns, councils in Edinburgh, Aberdeen and the Highlands continue to consider their plans for a tourist tax. Andrew Black, Reporting Scotland. Voting's underway to elect a new deputy leader of the SNP. There are three candidates in the race, all with differing views on the timing of another independence referendum. Here's our political correspondent, Glenn Campbell. Among those campaigning for a second referendum, there's a lively debate about timing, and that's spilled over into the contest for the SNP deputy leadership. Inverclyde councillor Chris McAlaney has made a demand for Indiref 2 within 18 months, the centrepiece of his campaign. We need to start a new Yes campaign right now so that we can get better answers on pensions, on currency and on the economy so we can take those arguments to every community across Scotland to make the case for why Scotland should be an independent country. Party activist Julie Hepburn wants to pick the best moment before the 2021 Holyrood election. Well, I think we should go for a referendum before the next election. We have a clear mandate and I, I do believe we should use that mandate and I believe we will use that mandate. So it's about leaving our options open and giving the First Minister the flexibility to hold the referendum at the best moment. Of course it will be for Nicola Sturgeon, rather than whoever replaces Angus Robertson as her deputy, to decide. Cabinet Minister Keith Brown backs his party leader's plan to wait for Brexit news before making the call on timing. Some are very concerned to make sure that we hold it only at a time we're absolutely certain to win it. You can never have that certainty. Some want to have it as soon as possible. But of course it's right that we take into account the views of the people of Scotland in relation to this. And they're facing the Brexit proposition just now. We have to have some clarity around that. The terms of any Brexit deal should be clearer by October. At some point after that, the First Minister will come to Parliament to update her preferred timing for a second independence referendum. The advice she receives from her deputy will vary depending on which of the three candidates SNP members choose to elect. Glen Campbell reporting Scotland, Holyrood. An MOT expert has told the trial of a driver accused of killing a Rangers fan in a bus crash in Ayrshire that there were no defects in the brakes. 49-year-old Callum Phillips denies killing 39-year-old Ryan Baird by dangerous driving after the accident in 2016 at the crossroads roundabout near Kilmarnock. He was driving the Nith Valley Rangers supporters coach, which was heading to the home match against Partick Thistle when it crashed. The trial continues. We can't claim to have a big royal occasion this weekend, but Scotland does have a Markle. It's in East Lothian, and we're well into our own wedding season. Aileen Clark has been speaking to those with speeches to polish and to one royal wedding guest who's finally got her frock. Love is in the air for Miss Markle, particularly here in Markle, East Lothian. Something borrowed, something blue, well, red, white and blue, actually. A specially made fishing fly in the bride's honour. She may not be aware, but she's putting Markle on the map. It seems to have drawn a wee bit of uh, attention. There's been people coming in and out of the fishery just to have a look round about. They're not actually fishing. They're just wanting to see the place. Uh, so it's actually been quite exciting. 
Now, Markle's 14th century castle may not boast the comforts of Windsor. How about doing another white one? But there's going to be a garden party here anyway, on the village green. Here we are, ready for tomorrow. I think bunting's going up later on and, and we're going to make the place look quite special. And we, the residents, are going to sit down and really enjoy it. But Kerry McPhee, Commonwealth Games mountain biker, will be at the actual royal wedding garden party. Along with her sister, they've been invited as ambassadors for their native Western Isles. But in Bridge of Allen this morning, after training, there was still the small matter of the outfit to sort. Wow, wow, that's fab. Oh, ridiculously excited, but I don't think we're as excited as everyone else is about the fact that we're going. I cannot believe how into the Royal Wedding people are. And everyone is asking, what are you wearing? And what's happening on the day? And will you get to meet the Royals and so forth? The people, are, people are going absolutely bonkers for it. It's incredible. And that, you get swept up in that, and it's really, it's really cool. And it is once-in-a-lifetime thing to, to be able to do. Kerry's dress hunt only got underway yesterday and her mission perhaps a little understated. It's not every day um, one of your customers comes in and asks you to dress them for a wedding and then drops in at the 11th hour. Oh, by the way, it's the wedding in Windsor, just the wedding of the year, so we are super excited. I doubt if the royal family will still be sorting out their favours, but for Krisha Isaac and Danny Knowles and Glenn Farg, their somewhat smaller wedding tomorrow will do just fine. The bit that I'm quite nervous about is when you walk down the aisle and everybody turns to look at you. So imagine that being like 600 people. I would just, I don't know, I would just, oh, yeah. yeah, that gives me the fear, doesn't it? I just, it would definitely make my speech a lot harder. Yeah. I, I, I'm not actually <laughs> nervous for getting married. No. I'm nervous for the speech. Just the gifts for the bridesmaids to wrap up now. But when Heather Brandon and Paul McNellis tie the knot in Glasgow tomorrow afternoon, they'll try to keep the royal wedding at bay for a day. I've decided not to watch it because I just like to focus on Paul and I's day. Um, I will definitely be watching it on the Sunday, 100%. I can't, I can't wait to see what Megan's wearing and everything like that. But I've just made the decision that on Saturday morning, we're just going to focus on ourselves. And if she's allowed to watch the Royal Wedding, I'm allowed to watch the Scottish Cup final. So, give and take. <laughs> the art of negotiation. Always handy for any bride and groom, royal or otherwise. Aileen Clark, reporting Scotland. There's one part of Edinburgh where there's much royal wedding enthusiasm to be found. This week, former crew members of the Royal Yacht Britannia return for their annual gathering, as Stephen Godden reports. Every year, the yachties, as they're known, return to the ship they once called home. Each day starts with a hymn before the hard work begins providing the backdrop for this year's efforts, the latest royal occasion. We're all naturally excited to be, to be all teaming up again, but, you know, royal occasions are something that we used to experience on a regular basis, state visits to, to, to name but one. And so I think with this week culminating with the royal wedding on Saturday, I'm feeling the ambience a little bit more jubilant than, uh, than normal. All over Britannia, the signs of celebration are there. Some are more easily deciphered than others. For this special occasion, we're flying what's called the It's for Splice, the main brace. In nautical terms, we use the flags Alpha, Delta, and then it, it's the figures 2 and the figure 8. So Alpha, Delta, 2, 8 basically means Splice, the main brace. After the event on uh, Saturday, the Queen will send out a signal to the whole of the fleet saying, Splice, the main brace, well done, have a tot. Britannia was once the honeymoon destination of choice for royal couples. And as visitors are reminded, it's also where Prince Harry spent many of his childhood summer holidays. The royal wedding has caused a bit of a stir on board Britannia, but the question is whether the royal yacht represents an oasis of enthusiasm here in the port of Leith. Not far away, at the foot of the walk, a quick test. The royal wedding. <laughs> I didn't know there was a royal wedding. Honestly. <laughs> you didn't know there was a royal no, wedding? No, I'm Swedish, but, and I don't really, follow, like, I'm not, um, no, I, I, I'm not a, a fan. I don't really think anything, to be honest. Do you care at all? Not really. <laughs> Will you be watching? No. Well, of course I'll be watching. <laughs> you can go to the wee room. <laughs> In days gone by, Britannia would have enjoyed a more active role. Now, from afar, 
a symbol of the monarchy's past, offers best wishes to tomorrow's royal couple. Stephen Gordon reporting Scotland on the Britannia. You're watching BBC Reporting Scotland. It's quarter to seven. A reminder of tonight's top story. One of the biggest teaching unions says pupil behaviour in secondary schools is getting worse. And still to come, who'll lift the cup? Celtic take on Motherwell in the Scottish Cup final at Hampden, with both sides hoping to make history. And yes, indeed, it's a big sporting weekend. Celtic take on Motherwell in the Scottish Cup final. And in rugby, there's the Pro 14 semi-final tonight as the Glasgow Warriors go up against the defending champions, Scarlets. In a moment, we'll be live with David Curry at Scotston. But first to our senior football reporter, Chris McLaughlin, who's at Hamden. Chris. Yes, good evening, Sally. On the eve of the 133rd Scottish Cup final, the oldest trophy in world football is the prize and final preparations are ongoing here at Hamden. We've got some fans groups in just preparing some pre-match displays. The pitch, as you can see, looking absolutely pristine. Hamden has her glad rags on as another chapter in the history of Scottish football is about to be written. She said it's for the whale and we're going to with all the feel of a victory parade, this was good luck. A town turning out full of hope as their heroes started their Scottish Cup journey. On to the team hotel and possibly on to history. It's not about anything other than, you know, becoming legends at the football club. We've told them that, and, you know, and that's a, a really nice pressure to put yourself in that situation. To be able to go and have the opportunity to win a Scottish Cup final is fantastic. And, and the boys have embraced it as have the marketing team. They're still steel at the heart of Motherwell. The spirit of the thousands who once forged is now embodied in us all. A club video with a difference. Players as steel workers, pride in the past and in the present. We define our own destiny. In Scottish football's dream factory, heroes are forged and memories made. In four final meetings, Celtic have won them all, including this in 1951. At Hampden Park, Motherwell kick off, playing from right to left. MacPhail gets the ball, beats two defenders, lobs over Johnston, and it's a goal! <laughs> Sixty-seven years later, demolishing all before them, and Celtic have their eye on a historic double treble. The clean sweep, two years running, has never been done before in Scottish football. Well, that shows you how tough it is, as much as anything. I think that, you know, of the great teams and, and managers and players that have been up here, it had not been done in the whole history of what is a wonderful football country, then that tells you the magnitude of it. Two clubs separated by one old trophy and differing expectations, but united in an age-old dream. Yes, yeah, so it's Celtic defending this trophy, going for that double treble. Motherwell last won it in 1991, so a huge game in prospect here tomorrow. Tonight, though, across this city, another huge match involving another sport. And David Curry is there. Yes, thanks, Chris. I've got my glad rags on as well because Scotston in the sun is the place to be this evening. It's the home of the rugby team Glasgow Warriors and it's sold out for tonight's Pro 14 semi-final against the Welsh club Scarlets. 10,000 people will be here, most of them hoping to cheer Warriors to a place in the final a week on Saturday in Dublin. Can they do it? Let's ask a Warriors player, Richie Vernon. Richie, good evening. Warriors have the home advantage. How significant might that prove? Hopefully for us it proves really significant. We've been outstanding this year at home. It's been a real fortress for us. I think we've got 49 out of 50 available points here in the league. 10 uh, wins out of 10, that's 10 remarkable. wins out of 10 and just uh, one missed bonus point against Edinburgh, which was a little bit disappointing. So um, yeah, it, it's really important and I think over the whole history of the Pro 12 playoffs, there's only one away team has ever won uh, an, an away semi-final and that was Scarlet's last year. So it's uh, it's going to be it's gonna be a tough test, but home, home field advantage hopefully should uh, be key. I hate to be a spoil sport, but Glasgow have had a wee bit of a dip in form, losing three out of their last four matches. Is that a worry? 
Um, it's certainly not a worry. I think uh, ideally, you know, we would have been building and those performances, those wins would have come at the end of the season. But within those losses, there's lots of good patches of play and we feel like some of the performances that we've put in have been there in parts. The key for us is going to be having that confidence that we showed in some of our best performances this season and being able to piece that all together into one 80-minute performance. Scarlets will be formidable opponents and they are the defending champions. Yes, they are, and uh, they've already showed their pedigree by getting to the, the quarterfinals of the European Cup this year. Um, they've had some outstanding performances, and we obviously went over there early on the season and came away uh, with a tough loss. So we know they're an outstanding team with guys like John Barkley in their squad, uh, Tad Byrne, Steph Evans. They've got guys that are playing really well. So they've got lots of dangers across the field, but I think for us tonight it's about what we do well and hopefully being able to put that all together. Now, Warriors won their conference a canter, miles ahead of everyone else, but it all comes down, doesn't it, to this 80 minutes of rugby this evening? Exactly, and uh, that's the crazy thing about the league is that all you want to do is try to secure that home semi-final. We've done that, which is fantastic, and it's probably our, our equal best league position ever at the end of the regular season, but it'll count for absolutely nothing unless we can get that win tonight. It's, uh, it's going to be a huge test for people, and the intensity always picks up for these semi-finals. So I'm really excited to watch, and I hope you guys can do the business. Thanks very much, Richie. Enjoy the oh. evening. And uh, you can listen to the match on BBC Radio Scotland or indeed watch it on BBC Alipa. Thanks very much uh, to David there at Scotstone and Chris McLaughlin at Hampden. Now, people are being asked to say where they think whales, dolphins and porpoises can be seen on Scotland's west coast. The idea is to create a Hebridean whale trail. It'll be the first of its kind in the UK, aiming to showcase the history of the relationships people have had with whales in the region. They died almost 400 years ago, and today their remains were reburied at a special service in Durham. They were Scottish soldiers who'd been imprisoned inside Durham Cathedral after the Battle of Dunbar in 1650. The mystery of where they were buried lasted centuries, until five years ago, when building work in the city uncovered a mass grave. Jonathan Swingler has more. Lord God Almighty, before whose face the generations rise and... It's been a long wait for a fitting ceremony for these men. After the Battle of Dunbar in 1650, the soldiers were marched to Durham Cathedral, where many later died. The remains of up to 28 are being buried. Researchers were able to establish what one of the men looked like. There were many more prisoners who lost their lives. Around 3,000 Scottish soldiers were kept inside the cathedral. The winter of 1650 to 51 was harsh. 1,700 died of malnutrition and dysentery. The ones buried today were discovered while building work was carried out on a cafe. The bodies appear to have been tipped into the ground. When the excavation was undertaken in, in 2013, we found that some of the burials went underneath the buildings of the current university library buildings on Palace Green. And we think that there are very probably a series of uh, other uh, mass burials lying there still. One man traced his family tree and believes his ancestors were among the soldiers. Very moving. Uh, I followed the story for some time. I wrote a book about my own family history in 2007 and I predicted that they, the skeletons would be found one day because I knew the story. I knew how the prisoners had been marched from uh, Dunbar without food to Durham and I knew that they'd been buried on Palace Green and I knew they hadn't been found. Officials travelled from Scotland. It's so important today to just remember those who died in, in the circumstances that must have been appalling in a real Scottish tradition of psalms and readings this morning it was really a very, very special thing. Scottish soil was brought to this graveyard for today's ceremony. It's just a mile from where the remains were discovered. Jonathan Swingler, reporting Scotland, Durham. Well, lots going on this weekend. What's the weather going to be like, Corsa? Oh, Sally, it's going to be lovely for many of us. In fact, today was lovely as well, wasn't it? Good evening to you all. Some bright blue skies, beautiful sunshine. And this is a scene sent in from one of our weather watchers a little while earlier in eastern Bartonshire. Lovely bright blue skies and sunshine here. And we'll continue to see high pressure dominating our weather as we head into the weekend. Perfect weather for a royal wedding, but perfect for us all. Plenty of dry, fine weather. But you can see this weather system out in the Atlantic. And this may spoil things somewhat for the far northwest later in this weekend.
But for today, too, it did bring, we had more in the way of cloud across parts of the northwest, and this had an impact on our temperatures. Where we had the best of the sunshine, we climbed up to 20 Celsius for parts of a Boyne. Compare that with Harris and the Western Isles, only reaching 10 degrees today. And where we have that thicker cloud across parts of the northwest, it will tend to thin and break as we head through to the evening. And there will be plenty of clear skies overnight, light winds, maybe some patches of mist and fog forming as well. But less cold compared to last night, temperatures dipping to around 6 to 8 Celsius. And then for tomorrow, the start of the weekend and the better day, plenty in the way of sunshine around. It'll be dry, it'll be fine. And that cloud across parts of the far western Isles, the northern Isles, thinner compared to today. So if you're heading out around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, sunny spells for Shetland, reaching around 13 Celsius here, but a bit breezy. For the far north too, a bit more in the way of cloud, but for the mainland, temperatures could climb up to 22 Celsius for parts of the Murray Firth area. Across the central belt too, 20 degrees. And of course, for the cup final, well, we're expecting plenty of dry, bright weather, lots of sunshine, temperatures climbing up to 19 Celsius, just a little breezy at times. And that wind will tend to strengthen across the west coast, fresh to moderate at times, maybe a bit stronger across parts of through the minches across the northwest, where we still have a fair bit of cloud around and temperatures here around 14 degrees. Now, if you're planning to head to the hills and mountains tomorrow, it will be quite gusty as well, especially for the northwest highlands, for the Cairngorms, the Coolin and Sky Ranges, maybe gusting up to 40 miles per hour, but plenty of sunshine around, the best of which for the border hills. But remember the sunscreen, UV levels will be reaching around 6 or 7. Now, remember that weather system that I talked about earlier. Well, we're expecting Saturday night into Sunday, that weather system approaching the northwest, and it may bring a bit more in the way of cloud across and also a bit more in the way of rain, which could be heavy at times for the west coast, for the northwest. But the best chance of any drier, brighter weather will be further towards the south and the east, and temperatures reaching the high teens, so still not too bad on the whole. And that's your forecast for now. Thanks very much, Corsair. A reminder now of tonight's main news. Up to 10 people have been killed after a gunman opened fire at a school in Texas. One suspect, a pupil, is in custody. President Trump has expressed his sadness and heartbreak at the shooting, which took place 40 miles south of Houston at Santa Fe High School. Here, proposals for a tourist tax are causing concern among small business owners who argue it would deter visitors. But councils in Edinburgh, Aberdeen and the Highlands who are all considering introducing a tourist tax say it would bring in vital support for the industry. And that's Reporting Scotland. I'll be back with the headlines at 8 and the late bulletin just after the 10 o'clock news. Until then, from everyone on the team, have a good evening. Bye.